IoT, powering the digital economy. Brought to you by Schneider Electric. Energy powers everything we do, but it's digital innovation and internet communication that's changing the relationship energy companies have with their customers. That's because how we use and exploit energy is evolving. So how do energy companies navigate the complicated world of the Internet of Things? Renewables are shaking up the world's energy supply. Wind and solar energy is reducing our reliance on oil and gas and with the help of subsidies, consumers can produce their own energy. The landscape is changing for all businesses that produce the energy we consume. So in this programme, we're taking a look at how the big players in energy supply are adapting to the digital revolution. We find out how consumers can take control of their energy needs with devices like Schneider Electric's Wiser and Alphabet's Nest and sell the energy they produce to make a profit. I'll also be talking to one of the energy regulators, the people who hold the energy companies to account about supplying us with energy and who also make sure the regulations cover advancements in machines and digitalization, all aimed at keeping the flow of energy consistent at all times to provide us with as cleanly sourced energy as possible. Digital innovation in the energy sector is pushing forward at a fast pace and there's a danger that some of the traditional players will be left behind. But some companies are developing their own digital propositions. One of them is E.ON. They've been around since 2000 and since then they've expanded. They operate in countries all over Europe with an estimated 32 million customers. Marika Rice is Vice President and Head of B2C Innovation at E.ON's global energy business. This is the app so you can see your energy consumption. She's responsible for their growing residential portfolio. What has been the, the biggest technology disruption? Oh, that's a very big question. Well, for me, I would actually say that it's really about the democratization of energy. So it's moving away from selling and producing energy to our consumers to now actually helping them become independent of us. Customers can produce their own energy. They can buy solar panels and batteries. They can even uh, have a virtual power cloud that they can store their energy in as much as they want. We call it the solar cloud. Uh, and that helps customers to use their energy in the way that they want. If everyone is empowered to use their energy the way they want, what's in it for E.ON? That's a very good question and I think a lot of customers and uh, in general people think about that because in the past we did produce energy um, and we sold it to our customers. That was our main business model uh, and with the decentralization of energy that's not the case anymore. Uh, what we have to do today, which I think is really good, it gives us actually a lot of opportunities, is to help our customers with services and products to become independent of the grid. Uh, and that opens up a lot of opportunities. It's not just risk from going from the old to the new, it's actually a lot of very interesting business models, a lot of very interesting new ways of interacting with customers that we didn't do in the past, so it's very exciting. So let's talk about those good things you do for consumers. Give me some examples of how they're harnessing the technology that you're putting at their fingertips. Yeah, so we're also helping consumers to be able to go over from petrol cars to e electrical vehicles. Uh, and we use digital technology to be able to, for them to charge wherever they are. Uh, so we can see that when you're out driving, your car needs to be charged. We can see on a map, you use your phone, you say, oh, there's a charging station by Aon, you can charge your car there. Uh, we also help customers optimize their energy usage with different devices in the home. So that's very much in the IoT area. Uh, for example, we want our customers to um, 
uh, when they come home. Their home needs to be warm and comfy, uh, and we don't want them to lose or um, waste energy. So we can, for example, control their thermostats. Um, we can also help them with optimizing other types of energy in their home. So not only are we uh, making the, the, it more sustainable with using renewable power, we're also using um, helping using that renewable power in the best possible way by controlling devices in the home for our customers. How do you stay profitable and also maintain, I suppose, a, a united platform, particularly when you're operating in lots of different countries? I would actually say that the rise of digital technology and digital platforms helps with that. Uh, and I always like to take the um, example of if you are a retail company and you want to have a global company, it's actually very difficult because you have to build up your retail chain usually in every single country you are, or at least parts of it. But digital products are often very easy to scale. What you have to do, and that's something that I do in my job, is to find those needs that consumers have that are more universal. But to be totally honest, customers in in, this, in different countries have very similar names. I mean, customers want to be warm in their home. They want to be sustainable and green. And if you find those needs, you can actually produce digital services that you then very easily can scale across markets. Traditional energy businesses like E.ON are making big changes to how they operate. But what about the energy businesses that operate entirely online? I've come to Nest. They're a technology company and one of many that offer smart devices for the home, such as thermostats that learn from our daily routines. Lionel Gachartala is Welcome head of product Nest. marketing at Nest Europe. So Nest is a company that came in 2011 and actually 2014 in Europe and, and the UK. And our goal is to change home and take care of the people that are inside it. So take an example, you know, you live into homes and you have objects that are supposed to help you save energy, be comfortable, be safe or secure, give you peace of mind. We thought, can we use technology? Can we use design? Can we use machine learning to start change the discussion there and bring products that are connected to your smartphone so you can control them remotely, but also will be smart to help you save on energy 60% of your energy bill in the UK can be controlled from the thermostat. So the smarter it is, the more the consumer can help and be comfortable and save on energy. So Lionel, what would you say is truly innovative about what you're doing? Today, many companies are talking about machine learning. We were actually using machine learning before it was a buzzword or people were talking about it. The thermostat we use learning and it's super innovative because the goal is to understand the context of your home, to understand the weather outside, and to make the programming for you. And then understand if you are home or not home and adjust, again, the temperature accordingly. And by doing these two things kind of magically, so you don't think all the time I have to take my smartphone and press a button, here we just have technology sensors working together to make that happen. And that's innovative. To what extent would you say that the technology you're using is disrupting the energy sector as we know it? Oh, I think, first of all, the approach uh, is disrupting. We are empowering the consumer to save on energy, be engaged with that energy consumption. It's already very disruptive. Then on the product itself, there are a lot of disruptions and innovation on the hardware side, the software side. The fact that we are programming the thermostat by itself all, all you have to do is to tell the temperature you like. That is disruptive because finally you have a product that you don't have to guess when to start, when to stop. The technology is taking care of that and doing that very smartly, always optimized. We're also working with energy partners to go a step further. Is Time optimization is one way to save energy, but temperature optimization is another one. And we have a service with our energy partners to essentially reduce by a tenth or two tenths of a degree, where as a user, you will never sense it. But the end of that, the sum of these little tweaks at night or when you're awake, etc., will save you up to 5% additional energy. And that's the kind of combination that we do between energy companies and us to help consumers be more comfortable and, and save a bit more. 
And it's that relationship between energy and technology providers that sees products from companies like Schneider Electric come into their own. Wiser is the group's range of thermostats and radiator valves for the home, which can be controlled by an app. Digital technology is having a big impact on how we power our homes and where we get our energy from. But that poses challenges, not just for energy companies, but for the regulators who protect consumers' interests. After the break, I'll be finding out how regulation and businesses tackle those challenges. The supply and distribution of the world's energy is changing rapidly. New technology is making energy production cleaner and more efficient. And this new tech means new opportunities for business, and that requires regulation. Andrew Burgess is Associate Partner for the Energy Systems Division at Ofgem, the UK's energy regulator. He joined Ofgem in 2008 from the Office of Rail Regulation. Andrew's also chair of the European Regulator's Smart Grids Coordination Task Force. Digital innovation in the energy sector is happening at such a fast pace. Where do you see the regulation going? Well, regulation needs to keep up with the pace of innovation, and um, sometimes that's a challenge for us regulators. What we need to do is to make sure that the regulatory rules change in line with innovation. Um, we took action quite a long time ago to make sure that the network companies, the monopolies within the sector, were harnessing innovation. We put various incentives on them and there are lots of trials of different ways of doing things which can benefit consumers. And for other parts of the sector, um, we want to make sure the industry rules are fit for purpose so that new people with new ideas, new services which can benefit consumers can come into the sector and provide that benefit. What about storage, especially when consumers start generating more energy themselves? Storage is a real, um, really exciting opportunity to change the sector. And we see lots of opportunities for consumers to have their own storage, have their own generation, um, and to benefit from that. But we also need to think about consumers in general and make sure that those who don't have the opportunity to have their own solar generation or own a battery don't end up paying more at the expense of those who do. Do you champion new technological innovation in the energy sector or is it the other way around? Are you being led by the innovations that are already taking place? To some extent we might be led because the world is changing so fast we need to be alive to all the ideas that are out there, startups, new people doing new things. But we also need to try as far as we can to be ahead of the game and predict where the change is coming and change the rules. Um, ahead of time rather than being a barrier to, to good things happening. It's the breaking down of regulatory barriers that Marika Rice of E.ON wants to see. I think when it comes to the sustainability agenda, uh, I think we as a company, we are really trying to do disruptive and more innovative business models. It would really benefit both consumers and the market and the planet uh, if we pushed those types of regulations where it's easier for customers to, for example, move from uh, using petrol car to electricity driven car or to be able to actually beneficial for the customer to have a solar panel. Those business models becomes quite difficult because there isn't incentive enough from the regulation to actually have green, sustainable power. Um, I do believe that it's coming, but it's a little bit lagging. When it comes to, to data and data privacy, I think it's incredibly important that all customer data is safe. Um, and I would say that we still, in from a European standpoint, um, we haven't set all rules and regulations here. Uh, I think the regulators could be quicker of doing so, and that would also help with uh, competition, etc. What new regulation have you seen been introduced since the, the, the rise and the introduction of digital innovation? I would say that the things that are really affected us in, in a positive way is that a lot of the markets are still becoming deregulated in the areas that we are, uh, and that means that customers can actually switch providers easier. We like to take that as an opportunity instead of a threat. We use digital technology to ensure that our services are as so good that customers actually choose us instead of another provider. So we take this as an opportunity to then grow instead of being scared of losing customers. For Nest and their range of smart devices that talk to each other, their focus seems to be on data security. You're talking about an ecosystem where appliances in the home can all talk to each other. What about the security implications though? Because the more everything's connected, 
doesn't it make it easier for, for them to be hacked? Security, privacy also of our consumers is, is extremely important. And it starts by when you design the technology is to make the right choices in terms of encryption, in terms of pairing technology when you set up your, your uh, product that it's secure and nobody can get in the middle of that and try to hack. There is no sharing of status or information without the explicit consent of the user. And it's not a long legal page where essentially you just agree because you don't want to read it. The way we do this is a user interface telling you, for example, your Nest Learning thermostat is going to share information with Whirlpool because when we know the energy is expensive, your washing machine can, or your white goods appliances could actually move into energy saving modes or delay the start because they know the energy is expensive. As a consumer, I understand what's being shared, I agree, and it works. So that's all from a design point of view, but also from a technology, what we are doing to keep everyone safe and secure. But a cyber criminal could hack into my kettle for example, an innocuous home appliance, and from that be able to control my thermostat, from that be able to control my energy and potentially hold me to ransom. There is a belief about this, but the reality is you have such a multi-layered security that it's not because you take control of one element of the chain that you can freely go on all the products that could eventually connect to it. If you ever hack into one, you can't get access to the other ones because there is different layers of authentication, security, keys that will be different and you don't get access to this. And it's, again, extremely important that it goes that way. In the business world, regulating the energy sector is a huge challenge and one that will need more attention as digital technology develops. That new digital innovation is changing the way we live our lives. After the break, we'll be finding out what technology is around the corner. We're seeing a global revolution in consumers generating their own power. From small communities to the world's largest capitals, consumers are taking control of energy consumption. Repowering London is a non-profit organisation started in 2011. They have four solar energy cooperatives running in South London, run by CEO Agamemnon Otero. We're standing on the top of the Bannister House estate and there are 13 buildings which have solar panels on them um, and that's just old, low-tech, you know, solar now works and it's generating energy and going into the buildings um, and making a savings. But we're also installing um, smart meters in, in, around for individual residents so they can then be very aware of what they generate. Smart monitors are connected to the electricity meters in each of the properties on the estate. So this energy monitor tells me exactly how much energy is being used in the home. As we use different parts, different types of electrical devices, it shows us on the monitor how much um, money we're spending and it's helped me to sort of decide on which appliances I need to use a bit less of um, because they use more energy. I've saved around about a couple of pounds a week from using this new system, but it adds up over the year so it is a, a significant amount. The £150,000 cost of the project was raised by the residents. In return for investing in the energy cooperative, they get a share of the profit when the energy is sold back to the grid. While it might not seem like a large amount, £150,000, this project, all of it, was raised from the local community within eight weeks. There's a 4% return on their investment. Uh, there's a savings to the building owner, so the, the actual council is making a savings as well. So the financial benefits stream out both for members and the partners involved. This new world where the energy we use isn't from traditional sources could pose problems for big suppliers such as E.ON. E.ON's at the forefront of energy supply, but increasingly it seems that the consumer is going to be the energy producer of the future. How's that going to change the way that the market operates? Going from a history where we just produced energy and we sold it to our consumers uh, to a world where energy is completely decentralized and that has quite a few both opportunities but of course also risks when you have very many different areas of decentralized energy. So there's more microgrids around that could actually make the grid to some extent 
unstable because we don't know when is someone producing or when is the sun going to shine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but that's also an opportunity, and that's something that we do at AI, where we create actually digital platforms to be able to control the different devices and the different energy systems. So when there is someone producing, we can then help uh, another customer that might have not have energy at that point, and that's an interesting business model as well. If consumers are going to have your solar panels and if they're going to be able to trade their energy amongst themselves, what role will Aon play in that peer-to-peer -peer trading? So our role here is, I would say, first of all, to make it really safe because, and that's why we use blockchain technology to ensure that if I sell my energy to you, um, you know that you get paid, so making sure that that works. And then being able to, when there are more homes doing this together, ensuring that there is always energy everywhere. So if there's, for example, a lack of energy, that we can feed in more energy to that microgrid, or that we may be, be able to take energy from someone's battery in the home, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so we will play really the platform player here, ensuring that the system works, uh, and we will also ensure that it happens safely. So where do you see Aeon? in the next 10 years? Will you still be a producer and distributor of energy? Yes, I think we will. I think we will always have a role there, but I also believe that uh, Aeon can play a much bigger role than that. I still truly believe that we have a enormous knowledge when it comes to energy and how to be able to help customers optimize save energy, make the planet better. Um, and I truly believe that that's gonna continue being our main role, but the opportunity with digital platforms is just that if you already have a foot in the home of your consumers, the opportunity lies there uh, in a very short future to be able to actually do other small things where there's good business models and good ways to help our consumers. Trading green energy with your neighbours may soon be the norm. In fact, companies that are manufacturing smart devices for our homes are even more upbeat about the future. Lionel guichard callin reckons smart devices are only going to get smarter. In the future, we are very excited by the progress on artificial intelligence. And to go again further into that idea that your thermostat or any other products that we could have could do more for you than you have to do for it. I mean, you still have today to do a lot like telling objects what to do, when to do it, how to do it. Our job and our goal is to get rid of that layer. Lionel is talking about a centralised system of devices that uses artificial intelligence learnt from sensors. Just like Wiser's on radiator thermostats can automatically set and update temperatures for each room in your house. These devices are part of the revolution in digital innovation. But there's more just around the corner. You've already got your, your smart thermostat. What about the, the, the future home in five to ten years time? What, what's that going to look like? How's it going to be? How, how, who will control it? As Nest, the other lemon that gets us very, very excited is how you can control your home without a smartphone. Smartphones are fantastic remotely, but inside your home, you know, that would be great if you can just talk and have interaction with your home. So we're working with Amazon, we are working with Google and the Google Assistant to essentially enable that. And we have great consumer reaction to that way of controlling. So voice recognition, AI, augmented reality as well. Those are your part of your vision for the future. Who are your future customers going to be? Because the cost is going to come down, but not so much that it's going to be for everybody, right? Energy companies are helping us. You know, when the thermostat is tied to an energy contract, you could actually, in some countries, get it for free. So it's not the cost of the device is secondary to the goal of saving energy and having you, uh, providing you energy essentially for a longer time. Smart devices, such as those sold by Alphabet and Schneider Electric, combined with energy customers becoming energy producers, are already changing the face of the energy sector. Is only made possible by infrastructure companies providing back-end energy solutions, making the B2C experience seamless. Those who invest in that technology will be the ones to survive the energy revolution.
IoT, powering the digital economy. Brought to you by Schneider Electric.